Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Got a good looking crowd tonight. Thank you so much for coming out on a Friday night. I'm thinking some people are getting extra credit. You're right. <laughs> Taking notes, it's always a dead giveaway. Uh, but that's great. Where are you from? Uh, Bayside High. Bayside High, fantastic. Good school. Boo. <laughs> Uh, it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Daniel Bacheldor. Uh, Dr. Bacheldor got his uh, PhD from the University of Hertfordshire uh, in 2004, which I try. Uh, I learned my British from Monty Python and also my French. Uh, <laughs> it is true. But uh, he uh, has been with us for two and a half years. He is a rising star among our faculty and uh, our observatory director. I'm sure most of you uh, have run into him before. And uh, without further ado, Dan will be talking about extreme contrast ratio astronomy. Take it away. Well, thank you, Dr. Wood, for that generous introduction. And thank you all for coming this evening. It's nice to see so many Florida Tech students here when exams are looming so closely to their necks next week. OK, so I suppose um, I should give you a little bit of background. Uh, my PhD was actually uh, to do with looking at supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. So this is a big departure from uh, my comfort zone, if you would like. And, um, that being said, uh, I can only give you a superficial background on a lot of the reasons why I've decided to pursue this particular research area at this time. Nevertheless, I hope it gives you uh, young researchers in the audience a little bit of hope to realize that whatever you decide to do at graduate school is not necessarily going to define the researcher that you will be for the rest of your life. There is an opportunity to change research tracks if the need arises. So without further ado, I'll move on and actually explain how I got to this particular uh, research topic. And it is through actually looking at supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. <laughs> I do have power at Florida Tech. Right. So in the um, supermassive black holes world, if you like, we are able to directly measure black hole masses in the local universe by seeing the gravitational effects of matter, particularly stars and gas, revolving around those black holes to infer their mass through simple Keplerian uh, dynamics. Now, outside of the local universe, the spatial resolution needed to do that uh, is um, quite high to the point where even the Hubble Space Telescope cannot make these observations uh, outside of around uh, 20, 30 megaparsecs or so. Megaparsec is just a very long distance in astronomy. I'm sorry to throw these terms in here, but to explain a megaparsec, w w I've got better things to talk about right now. Needless to say, it's quite a long distance, but not that far. Certainly it's not as far as these quasars that we see in the universe that are themselves supermassive black holes that are actively gobbling up matter, which is what is making them so bright. So bright, in fact, that two things happen. First, we can see them at very, very large distances, all the way back to very near the beginning of the universe itself. <coughs> Second, they are so bright that typically we cannot actually see the host galaxy in which they reside. So in itself, to take uh, black hole research to the next step, we need to be able to see the host galaxies of these accreting supermassive black holes and determine whether relationships we see in the local universe between black hole mass and galaxies actually hold at uh, early times in the universe. Of course, seeing the host galaxy itself, when you look at this image on the left, this is a picture of a very famous quasar. In fact, one of the first quasars, or the first quasar that was identified. It just has some number to do with uh, who or where it was discovered. C is for Cambridge, the real Cambridge, the one in the important country. <laughs> but 
But on the left here, we see that it actually looks like a star, this quasar. It's only when we stick a spectrograph onto this object, which breaks up its light into its component wavelengths to tell us exactly what the dynamics are in that object and what chemical elements are present. It's only when we stick a spectrograph on this object that we see it's very different from a star. It is a quasi-stellar uh, object, a QSO. Now, when we actually block out the central light using a coronagraph, a coronagraph is essentially just a little penny, if you like, stuck in front of the bright part of the object, so that we block out the light from the bright quasar, we actually see that there is a host galaxy behind the brightness of the quasar. This is an example of high contrast ratio imaging. And this is why I decided that perhaps looking at high contrast ratio imaging or extreme contrast ratio imaging, which is just a word to get you into the audience, right? Uh, this is why I decided to start to look into this particular research area. It turns out that extreme contrast ratio imaging is important for more than just quasar studies. The graphic you are seeing now is all of the known near-Earth objects at this time. All of these objects are within 0.3 AU, one-third of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Any object you see in green, those of you who have got good color perception will see that there are green and yellow points on this plot. Green ones are predominantly over here. The green points are the vectors, the magnitude and direction of the velocity of these uh, near-Earth objects. If they are green, it means that they are going to orbit further from the Sun than the Earth. If they are yellow, they are going to orbit closer to the Sun than the Earth. The red circle that you see here is 10 times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. You will notice that there are a large number of near-Earth objects very, very close to us. Why is this important? Two reasons. If one of them hits us, we become the dinosaurs. Another important reason is that if we actually get to the point in our technology where we can visit one of these near-Earth objects, it might provide an interesting mining opportunity, probably for somebody like Donald Trump. <laughs> the problem with spotting these near-Earth objects is that they are very faint. So faint, in fact, that when we look at a bright star on the galaxy, uh, in, the, in our galaxy, this is Sirius, actually the brightest star uh, in our night sky, if there were a large near-Earth object in this region of the sky, we wouldn't be able to see it unless we had the ability to have, uh, unless we had the ability to detect high contrast ratios. So the contrast ratio should be quite clear to you now about what it really means. It is the ability to pick out something faint next to something very bright. If there were a large asteroid coming straight towards us from the direction of Sirius, we wouldn't be able to see it. It would make for a very interesting surprise one Monday morning. This brings up another interesting point. As we make larger and larger telescopes, the effect of brighter and brighter stars becomes uh, worse and worse, if you like. We don't actually really have much idea about what the sky looks like behind Sirius. Small telescopes, sure, can take a look at Sirius, it looks pretty, but we can't actually make out much detail of the sky behind Sirius. Large telescopes would be able to see faint things if Sirius wasn't in the way. So actually determining the characteristics of bright star fields is really uh, an unknown in astronomy. There could be some all sorts of interesting objects hidden within the glare of Sirius that we, we really don't know about. Moving on. Why else might we be interested in extreme contrast ratio imaging? Here is a picture of the, the Pleiades. It's a collection of stars that have recently formed. And within this stellar nursery, we find, if we look very, very closely and very, very hard, a population of uh, really ill-defined objects. They are known as brown dwarfs. 
We do not know really whether they are failed stars or objects that are formed in the circumstellar disk of larger stars that are then ejected. So we do see that these are very, very faint compared to the very, very bright stars within the Pleiades. So one thing extreme contrast ratio imaging will enable us to do is to look into star clusters and even in the face of bright stars within that cluster still have the ability to detect a population of brown dwarfs. The numbers of brown dwarfs may give us an idea about uh, their origin and their importance. And this is known uh, in the astronomy community as uh, determining the very low end of the stellar mass function. A mass function is just how many stars of a particular mass are there. Moving on. <clears throat> when looking at star formation, or stars that have recently formed, we frequently see debris disks left over from the formation of that star. And here we have an example, once again, of um, Hubble Space Telescope coronography, and I'll explain this a little bit more in a moment, uh, blocking out the central light of the star to expose a dusty disk around the star. So by blocking the light out, once again, we can see this uh, very faint disk around the star. The star itself is a seventh magnitude star, uh, which is a particular way of saying it's just slightly too faint for you to see with your naked eye. And then the disk itself has something known as a surface brightness of 16.5 magnitudes per arc second squared, Obviously, that's Greek to a lot of you, but what it means is that you definitely cannot see it with your naked eye or with very many ground-based telescopes themselves. But the reason this disk is interesting is we can see structure in the disk. On the left, we actually have the coronagraphic image. On the right, we have a model of what this disk would look like if we were to look at it from the top down. So we see some interesting things. First of all, there are some bright companion stars up in the top left, and you can see that they're actually damaging the, the image, that they're so bright. And we can see that there's some kind of interaction between those stars, and there is some structure in the disk, the circumstellar disk. Now, the structure in this particular disk is likely due to the interaction, the gravitational interaction with these two companion stars. But in other systems, if you were to see gaps in disks like this, that would actually infer the presence of a planet around that star. So, the big question in astronomy now is, exactly how alone are we? It's kind of like the fundamental question that has been asked from the beginning of time, almost, the beginning of records. Are we alone in the universe? The first step to answering that question is going to be establishing how many planets we can find around other stars. And of this morning, here is where we stand with our planet detection. So these are the known number of planets around other stars. There are currently confirmed 763 planets around other stars. There are a further 159 that are looking, being looked at very closely. And some of you may have heard of the Kepler satellite, which is looking very closely at a particular region of the sky, purely looking for the signatures of planets. Currently in its database, we are waiting to find out on a further 2,321 planets. And this is just from a small portion of the sky. So you can infer from that what you like. But there is certainly a lot of planets out there. On the right here, we have an uh, artist's impression. It's always good for an astronomer to point out what is real data and what is an artist's impression. Over, well, both of these are artist's impression. This one's a little easier to tell. This one is an artist's impression of a planet discovered recently by the Kepler mission that sits in what is known as the habitable zone of its parent star. That is, it sits in a region 
not too close for the water to boil off and not too far away for the water to freeze. When I was an undergraduate, it was called the Goldilocks zone. So we have seen a planet, it's called Kepler-22b, we have seen a planet in a habitable region around uh, a star. All right. Now, there are many ways to detect extrasolar planets. But if you ever want somebody to believe you, it's always best to provide them with a picture. So there are many ways to infer the presence of planets by watching a star wobble, by watching a star wink. But the absolute best way to present something to somebody who might be skeptical is to say, look, I have a picture and it's not fake. So the power of direct imaging uh, of an extrasolar planet not only is going to provide us with concrete evidence that we can move forward with, but direct imaging of extrasolar planets is going to allow us to actually look into the details of that extrasolar planet. Perhaps it has an ocean, perhaps it has a landmass. As it rotates, it's going to vary its brightness. Perhaps it does have the signatures of life on that planet. Only by being able to study them this closely are we going to be able to actually approach that question, that big question, are we alone? So it may be a surprise to some of you, but so far we have directly imaged 31 planets around other stars. And here are a few examples. So over here on the left, we can actually see that they've used a cunning technique to block out the light, uh, to cancel out the light from the central star. Um, and when we block out that light, we can see uh, some large planets, four in this case, orbiting this star. Uh, the scale down here, uh, this distance here, is the distance from the Earth to Uranus. Over here, we see evidence for yet another planet using another cunning technique. And then the original one that you may have seen, the first image of a planet around another star, was taken, of course, with the Hubble Space Telescope, once again using coronography. When we block out the central light from this well-known star, Fomalhaut, we see over here, uh, you, those of you with excellent eyesight, uh, that when we blow up this uh, little square, we see the motion of an extrasolar planet around this system. If you're wondering what this is, this is a, uh, a background star. That's not a, not a planet. So not only have we inferred the presence of planets since 1995, extrasolar planets, we are now beginning to image them. However, out of the 763 that we know about, we've only got images of 31. And the reason is, it's hard. Okay. But the real question is, those planets that we have imaged so far, they're what we call hot Jupiters or, or super Jupiters. They're not really the planets that can answer the question, are we alone? So what about... Earth-size planets in habitable zones. And today we know of four. These are artist impressions. This is Earth, so this isn't an artist impression. We've got a pretty good idea of what it looks like. Uh, this is Mars over here for comparison. So we know about four planets in habitable zones around other stars. The number you see underneath the star gives you an indication of how similar to Earth, the, uh, sorry, the number you see underneath the planet is an indication of how similar that planet is to the planet Earth. 0.85 being 85% similar to Earth. And that number is based on um, various different uh, Diagnostics, and I invite you to go and look at the habitable exoplanet catalog to find out what those uh, parameters are. So they are out there. There are planets capable of supporting life out there. So what does it take to image one of these planets? 
This is a real picture. This is a picture taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it is moving further and further away from our own sun. Obviously, this is the planet Saturn. Saturn at the moment is acting as a coronagraph. It is blocking out the light of our own sun. And Cassini is looking back towards Earth. Earth is that pixel there. <laughs> Do you want me to point at it again? <laughs> Everything you've ever known, or will ever know, is in this dot right here. Do you think you're important now? So this is the challenge that we have. Just, just for looking for a planet, an Earth planet, around another solar-type star. Not even a, you know, a, a, a mega-spectacular star. Our sun's quite a boring star, really. So this is what it's going to take. But let's actually finally put some text up in this presentation. What do we really mean? What, what is it really going to take? Now, first thing to realize is that faintness and resolution are not really the problem with observing extrasolar planets. If we need more resolution and we want to detect fainter things, we build a bigger telescope. It takes, sure, it takes a bit more money, but it's not an impossible problem to solve. The real problem comes from the fact that the sun is 300 million times brighter than the Earth. And that is in the visible part of the spectrum, the part of the spectrum that you see now the blue through to the red. So if you wanted to observe an extrasolar planet, an exo-Earth around uh, a sun-like star, and you had the resolution and you had the sensitivity, the sensitivity allows you to see the faint things, it wouldn't really matter because the sun would be 300, time, 300 million times brighter than the Earth. Now, the story gets a little bit easier when we switch to infrared wavelengths, that, that's what this squiggle 20 micrometers means, microns. 20 microns, which is also a wavelength, we just can't see it with our eye, but it's something that we can build telescopes to see. The contrast ratio is only one million, which is actually a fairly small number in astronomy, if you think about it. So the real question is, our detector, or our instrument, is going to have to pick out a faint object from the glare of a bright object. The analogy to think of is a candle next to a lighthouse. The lighthouse is on. The candle is lit. <laughs> and it's a small candle. All right. Now, doing this is actually a really big issue for digital cameras. Astronomy nowadays has moved away from sketches moved away from photographic plates and now uses the same technology that you have in your cell phone camera to image the sky. It's just they are way more sensitive. They can see a lot fainter things. Because you guys just like taking photos of generally bright things, I presume. All right, so how do these digital cameras work? Watch out, here's some science. Right, actually, you, you could argue this is engineering, right? I'm appealing to a broad audience. Okay, so <clears throat> there are particular uh, elements in the universe known as semiconductors. Normally, they are not conductors. If you inject a bit of energy into them, they become conductors. That energy can arrive in the form of photons, which are particles of light. So a photon can hit an atom in a semiconductor, and now that semiconductor becomes a conductor. So the amount of charge generated in a semiconductor is going to be proportional to the number of photons that hit it. If we can then collect those charges and count them, we have made ourselves a digital camera. Okay? Now, it's the counting that becomes an issue. So here is what I present to my students when I'm lecturing them on how digital cameras work. There is something known as reading out the detector, counting exactly which pixel collected how many photons. Now, this is a complicated slide. 
So in order to give you an idea of how this works, we're going to do a little demonstration. All right, so thank you all of those who volunteered by sitting in the front three rows. You are now part of a detector. All right, so the pieces of paper in front of you, please carefully peel them off the desk and turn them over and do not tell anybody what is written on the other side. One of you is a star. But first, those of you who feel left out, I have two more jobs. If any of you are feeling particularly morbid, I have the job of dead pixels. <laughs> if you would like to be a dead pixel, then there are three spots for you, one here, one there, one there. There's no seat, so you have to stand there. I also have, I don't need people to do that, but I do need somebody to act as, let's say I'm the computer that's going to interpret the image. I need somebody to act as a go-between between between the audience, what you guys say, and what I'm going to understand. All right, so I do need a volunteer, not out of the first three rows, but the volunteer must be able to do their 10 times table. (laughs) Volunteer? All right. What's your name? Evan. Hi, Evan. Dan. This is Evan, everybody. If you come and stand here, Evan, please. All right. Here is the audience in rows one, two, three, and in columns one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Evan is acting as the audience to Dan converter. (laughs) All right. What is going to happen is that you guys are going to mostly pass your pieces of paper simultaneously to the left. But wait. (laughs) There are three special spots. One of them is dead. There are three special spots. So you can actually come and stand here. There are three special spots in this uh, row. So we're going to actually pass the data Uh, Sorry, in this column. We're going to pass the data along the rows and down the column. So your job is to read the pieces of paper as they come from Hannah, who is sitting behind you, and um, let me know what they are. Okay, so the first piece of paper is right here. Now remember, any number you see, you have to translate it to me. You have to multiply it by 10. All right? So go ahead and tell me what this number is. Just pick it up and turn it over. Oh, it's on the back. Yep. (laughs) Okay, the number is zero because it's a dead pixel. Okay, so zero times ten. Okay, all right, we have a dead pixel. All right, now the next piece of information is going to come from Hannah. Ninety. Okay, now the chap sitting behind Hannah is now going to pass his piece of paper forward and Hannah is going to pass it to you and you're going to do the same. Eighty. Eighty. Okay, there is now an empty column. Everybody must now pass their information one place to their left. And we do the process again. 90. 90? Okay, now turn behind you. 80. Okay, it's working. Thank you. (laughs) 90. 90. Okay, now everybody pass to the left. Okay? 110, good. 90. Okay, pass to the left. We need to go faster. 90. Zero. Dead pixel. 100. Okay. 200. 200. Ooh. 600. Whoa! 200. Oh. 600. 600. Okay. Do we think we've seen a star yet? No? Okay, what's next? 1,200. Oh. Keep going. We've got to finish the readout. 600. 
Okay. Nearly there. Zero. Zero. Oh, dead pixel again. 600. 600. 200. 200. <laughs> Zero. Zero. 100. 100. And 90. 90. Awesome. Everybody give our detector and Evan a round of applause. All right, that, I'll tell you how much that demonstration was mirroring me later. All right. Okay, so we've now read out our array. So you guys have been sitting there gathering photons, and one of you was a star. <laughs> Put that in your report. I'm a star. Okay, but how does this make an image? Well, now we have numbers, and we can assign a brightness to all of these numbers. And that brightness can be now displayed on our computer. And now we see that we have a star or the uh, representation of a star in our image. Okay? So that is how reading out a CCD works. You'll notice that it's highly inefficient. Some people can make mistakes, and that mistake will propagate all the way through. If everybody makes one mistake, then that mistake will propagate through all the way along the row and all the way down the column. Okay. So there are problems with this process. The first problem is, of course, dead pixels. The second problem is what I just described, the transfer efficiency. If there were just a one hundredth of a percent loss all the way along, we would have lost over 10% of the signal by the time we got down to Evan here. Also, uh, if you look at a bright light, you get a headache. That means you've saturated your eye, essentially. And pixels become saturated as well. Now, each of those numbers that you had, uh, by the time they got to me, were uh, in what we call counts. Now, a CCD typically can only count to about 65,000 before it says, I've had enough. It becomes saturated. At that point, it can do something quite alarming called blooming. And we have an example of blooming over here. It's where the charge in one pixel starts to spill into other pixels. Now, if we were looking at a bright star and there were a planet around here, you'll see how this is going to become a big problem. Not only are we going to have to deal with the glare of the star, but now the detector is becoming damaged around the bright star as well. So CCDs are not going to help us look at bright objects at all. Now, there are some other types of detectors. Uh, CMOS, which is, stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, or a photodiode. They're just different types of detectors. And they read out detectors in slightly different ways. They say, I'm not going to read out like that. That was highly inefficient. What I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to everybody at the same time, and you're going to shout at me what your numbers were all at the same time. But that's fine, because I'm now an awesome computer, and I can do that. All right, so we read that array out all at the same time, and all the data comes straight into the computer without having to go along the rows down the columns. However, um, whether it's a photodiode or a CMOS, there are still going to be, uh, in one or the other, the problems of saturation and blooming. OK. So what other methods are there for high contrast imaging that do not involve uh, using a CCD in the way that we just described? Well, you've seen this now a couple of times. This is the technique of coronography, where we simply block out the light from the central star. This is all well and good. It's just that now we've blocked out not only the light from the central star, but any hope of detecting a planet that is close to that star, an Earth, for example, an exo-Earth. You also have to be very precise in pointing your telescope and keeping your telescope pointed in exactly the same direction for coronography uh, to be effective. There is also the technique of nulling interferometry. Do not be afraid. Physicists like to use complex words to describe fairly simple things, and here is one example, except this one is actually fairly descriptive. If I have two telescopes spaced apart and I look at a star, and I take the wavelengths of the star uh, coming into two, each of those telescopes, 
and I let the wavelength of one of those telescopes, the, the wavelength of the light going through one of those telescopes, if I just hold it back by half a wavelength, when I combine the signal from the star, the red dots, it cancels out. It is nulled. However, if I look at a planet that is slightly offset from the position of the star, there's going to be a slight angle between the star and the direction of the telescope so that one telescope is going to get the signal from that planet slightly before the others and there's going to be constructive interference between the two telescopes for the signal of the planet. And actually one of those graphs we saw earlier shows you an example of nulling interferometry. The problem with this is you need two telescopes or more. So your cost goes up very, very quickly to do this. And we'll look at one more before we get to the, the new camera that we're using here. Angular differential imaging. Don't worry, do not be afraid. This is a technique whereby <clears throat> we simply watch the sky using a fixed orientation for our telescope which means all the effects of the telescope remain in the same plane relative to the detector. So all of the effects of the telescope, all of the brightness, the glare of the star, and these little patterns from the star are going to stay in the same position. And as the sky moves over our head, believe it or not, it rotates slightly. And as it rotates, any actual images on the sky are going to rotate in our frame of reference. Well, then if we uh, take a median of all of these individual images, which is sort of like taking an average, but not quite. If we take a median and then subtract it away from our original data, we're going to end up with anything that has changed in that image. If we then uh, derotate them, add them all together again, we end up with an image of something that may well be a planet. And here is an example over here of angular differential imaging. The advantages this have is it's actually fairly straightforward and not that expensive. Dollar-wise. Or time-wise, really. But each of these techniques that I've presented to you can still suffer from saturation and they force you to choose between observing the bright object or the faint object. Now you could have the best of both worlds, um, but it becomes a bit more complex to do that. They cannot deal with multiple bright objects. So if, for example, we're looking for brown dwarfs in a cluster of stars, we could only uh, either put a coronagraph on one of those stars, do angular differential imaging on one of those stars, use our nulling interferometry on one of those stars. We cannot take care of many bright objects at the same time. And actually, when fully developed, because they are being developed for imaging of exoplanets, the most likely thing is that they will only be good for imaging exoplanets, which doesn't give them a broad appeal. What we really need is to stand back and say, maybe we didn't think about how we built our CCDs very well. Is there a better way that we can read out our CCDs or our imaging detectors to take care of this brightness problem? Now, the methods, obviously I've pointed out that they are difficult to execute and expensive, and the simplest solution is to just take a camera that can do it. Over here on the left, we have a graph that shows you um, the dynamic range or the contrast ratio ability of an ideal detector. We want to be able to see something really faint and something really bright at the same time. Now, normal CCDs can only see about uh, this contrast ratio, and the human eye can only see about this contrast ratio. The camera that we've just installed on the Ortega telescope can see this contrast ratio ratio. It's not enough to see planets, but it's a step in the right direction. It's known as a charge injection device. What it allows us to do with the detector is randomly access any of the pixels. So I can come back to the star and I can say, you're a bright star, aren't you? You're going to get upset a lot more quickly than the rest of the people in the audience because you've got all of the signal. Well, how, why don't you just tell me 
what your signal is, and I'll just wait for these people to tell me sometime later. That's how the charge injection device is going to read out. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the, um, the actual uh, guts of how it works, but essentially the word injection comes from when the charges are put back into the semiconductor so that it can once again uh, start to gather signal. Now, I have to know which part of the image is going to be bright beforehand. So I have to take a pre-exposure. I have to quickly look at the sky, find out which is the bright bit, and go, aha, that is where I want to pay most attention to. So this is going to be my region of interest. So I take this pre-exposure to identify my region of interest. I'm then going to read out my region of interest many times whilst the rest of the detector the rest of you guys go looking for that planet, that faint planet. So you're not going to get upset and start telling your neighbour, look, I've got too much charge here, do you want some? Please. I'm getting a headache. The rest of you can just ignore him, let him get on with dealing with the star, and you guys can go do the cool stuff. So that's how a CC CID, a charge injection device, reads out. All right, so the camera that we have installed on the Ortega telescope, and I do invite you all in just over 15 minutes to go and have a look at it. It's all set up for you to look through, and hopefully those pesky little fluffy white things have moved on out of here so that we can go and look at Mars, for example. Here is what the Ortega telescope uh, looks like. If you haven't seen it before, please do come and have a look. Here is our camera mounted there. It's the uh, gold box, and it is kind of uh, in the middle of surgery. So the camera actually has an ex external cooling device, which means we need to run pipes to it to keep it cold. A cold detector is a happy detector. It's less noisy. But it does present an interesting problem for somebody who's slewing a telescope around the sky to have part of the telescope now fixed to the ground and these uh, little pipes. Uh, you have to be very careful about what's going on. So when we're using this detector, we don't have the luxury of sitting in the nice air-conditioned control room. We have to be up there in the dome making sure that coolant isn't going to suddenly appear on the floor. All right, so we have had the camera on Sky. We've had it on Sky maybe five nights now. And the immediate problem is with the pre-exposure. <clears throat> Remember I told you that we need to know which bit is going to be bright ahead of time. All right, well, those of you that have looked through a telescope before will notice something a little bit irritating about our Earth's atmosphere. Sure, it's good for breathing and all of that, but for astronomy, it sucks. And the reason is we are looking through uh, about meter-sized clouds that are all uh, meter-sized uh, gas cells, uh, atmospheric cells that are all moving at hundreds of miles an hour into and out of our line of sight towards that star. And every time they do that, they bend the light a little bit. And it produces this image. This is an actual image of what the star Polaris looks like through the Ortega telescope. This is annoying. And the reason is, if I want to take my pre-exposure, I need to take a short exposure. So let me take my short exposure. Aha, that's Polaris. Now I do my longer integration. So I, I've, I've said, okay, all of these pixels, I need to ask a lot of times how bright they are so that they don't get upset. All right? But one-tenth of a second later, they're all brightness is, the, the bright pixels are all in a different place. So this is a real problem for the pre-exposure because it means that whatever we, however we sample the sky for the pre-exposure, when we come to do our main exposure, it's going to be, the sky is going to be different. Problem. All right. So what have we tried to do to actually demonstrate the abilities of this camera? Well, first, the first thing we did was to look at the star Sirius. Sirius <coughs> has a white dwarf companion. Sirius has a brightness of 1.5. The, the, the magnitude scale is upside down. So uh, negative numbers means it's really bright. In fact, it's the brightest star in the sky. And it has a companion with magnitude 8.3, which is quite faint. Certainly something that you can't see with your eye. And if we were to be able to see, I'll tell you right now, I'll get to the crux of it, we couldn't see Sirius B um, because of the glare, as you can see. But the reason it was a good test is we knew exactly where it should have been. All right, we, were, we were trying to give us ourselves the, the best possibility of spotting Sirius B. 
So this is an actual image. This is a five second exposure using the extreme dynamic range of the, the camera. So we're sampling Sirius over and over and over and over and over again, trying to see if we can uh, drop the brightness of Sirius down or, or not have it. Sorry, that's the wrong thing to say. Actually not have the brightness of Sirius affect all of the pixels around it. And unfortunately, we couldn't see um, Sirius B, but Sirius A had six million counts. Now, remember, the CCD had 65,000 counts before it got upset. Well, we got to six million counts with Sirius A before the detector got upset. All right. It so happens that within the field, there is a, bright, a star that is the similar brightness to Sirius B. It's down here. And we knew how bright Sirius B was going to be based on this calibration star in the field. Imagine trying to see this faint star in this glare. That is the glare problem. However, there is good news. Close to Sirius, we've been able to detect quite faint stars. So here is a couple of examples, and the overhead projector doesn't do it justice, but we've detected a 10.8 magnitude star, a 12.5 magnitude star, and a 12.1 magnitude star, all within uh, this glare of, of Sirius. So we've started to detect the background stars. These were already known, obviously. I didn't do the photometric calibration myself. It was already known that they were there because somebody has stuck a coronagraph on Sirius and seen what's, what's in the background. But it's giving us hope because the contrast ratio between 6 million and, uh, where's the faintest one, 100, you know, it's, it's around 60,000. So that's, that's not bad. That's getting up there to where we want things to be. All right, what else did we do? Well, we were kind of scooting around the sky, knowing that we probably wouldn't be able to see the host galaxies of quasars, it, knowing that we couldn't see Sirius B, probably weren't going to see any other things that were very close because of the glare problem. So one of the things about the glare problem is that with an extended source, a planet, for example, that we can resolve, it's not such a big deal. But it is. This is Mars. This pancake is Mars. Okay, it has a magnitude of minus 1.1, or it did on the 13th of March, 2012. Magnitude minus 1.1. It has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. At that particular time, Deimos was magnitude 12.6, and it is right there. So we have been able to see Deimos around Mars. However, this is what Mars looks like when we use a normal one second exposure. It is completely saturated. So any number across the disk of Mars here is useless. We can't tell anything about Mars from this. But we could see Deimos. So we, we made the choice. We went for the faint thing. But we didn't have um, the luxury of seeing the bright thing. Now, there would have been other techniques we could have used to see the bright thing, but we want a camera that can do it both at the same time, right? So Q the extreme dynamic range mode. So the other good thing about Deimos is we know where it's supposed to be, which means we can pinpoint on the sky where it's supposed to be and watch it over an hour. This is the motion of Deimos over an hour. You can see it move, right? You can see dead pixels as well, right? And we found that there were 230 counts on Deimos and 2.2 million peak counts on Mars. Now, this was using extreme dynamic range mode, so you might ask, why don't we see Mars? Well, we have to look at a different section of the image. We now have to look at the bright section of the image, and when we do that, we got to see surface features on Mars, and we got to see Mars rotate at the same time. So what you're seeing here is a picture of Mars through our high contrast ratio camera, and uh, we observed it over the course of an hour and watched, actually, the surface features of the planet rotate into and out of our line of sight. So this is a contrast ratio about 10,000 to 1, but at least it's something a bit more interesting than not being able to show you Sirius B. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, from what we've learnt using the Ortega telescope with this camera, we're going to have to do something extra in order to detect Sirius B. That might be uh, 
installing what's known as a tilt tip adaptive optic system, you can actually vibrate a mirror in exactly the same way that the atmosphere makes stars twinkle. And if you do it in exactly the opposite way, hey presto, that's what I'm saying, uh, you can actually get the image of the star to fall within a single, well, a, a very tight region of the detector. So that would allow us to use the pre-exposure on a tip-tilt corrected um, image. The second thing we could do is we could just install a coronagraph. All we need to do is put something to block a certain part of the detector in the right place uh, onto, the, onto the telescope. And it's not that difficult to do. You could simply do it with the two, two pieces of crossed wire in the right place. So we might try that over the summer. Now, the CID we were lucky to pick up is actually, um, it is, you can buy it off the shelf, but it is quite new technology. So there are still some improvements that can be made to this detector to make it more sensitive. For example, there is a process in uh, building detectors called back thinning that would make it more sensitive. And we could also have a thermoelectric TE cooler added to it if it's back thinned which means I don't have to worry about my cables, my coolant pipes running to the back of the detector. It would all be sitting there quite nicely and happily showing me the wonders of the universe. We could also take the camera to a site where the atmosphere is not such of a problem. Sea level in Florida has its particular disadvantages for seeing the night sky. At sea level, you are seeing through an entire Earth's atmosphere. And it's actually quite hot here, if you haven't noticed yet, which means that the atmosphere can be quite turbulent. Florida Tech operates a one-meter telescope out at Kitt Peak National Observatory. So it's not beyond the realms of uh, imagination to actually take this camera out to Kitt Peak National Observatory, install it on our one-meter telescope out there, and see how well it does in a less um, violent atmosphere. There are also some things we can do to upgrade the software or at least figure out how the software works. <laughs> First of all, uh, so far we've only been uh, defining one region of interest. Okay, so this doesn't give it much advantage over coronography or, or ADI or nulling interferometry, but we will be able to define multiple regions of interest and say, not only is there a bright object over there, but there's a bright object over there, and yeah, I can deal with it. We also would be interesting in enabling user-defined regions of interest. That's where I could say, look, I know the star's jumping around and you don't. So I'm telling you it's going to jump around and this is my region of interest rather than you trying to figure it out, you being the software. And finally, I showed you a couple of images of Mars and Deimos and I had to show you the bright version and the faint version. There's no real nice way that I've come across of showing you them both at the same time. So there is a real issue here with how to display high contrast ratio images. A typical display can only show you 256 colors. Oh, this camera wants to show you 6 million colors. So how on earth are you supposed to actually condense all of that information into something that you can then interpret quite quickly? Okay, so in summary, Extreme contrast ratio imaging or techniques that are going to enable us to look at bright objects around faint objects are going to be our next great step forward in instrumentation ability in astronomy. It's going to ask, uh, it's going to allow us to ask the questions about the natures of quasar host galaxies, about the population of brown dwarfs, about the circumstellar dust disks, and one might argue most importantly about extrasolar planets. We have seen with a 0.8 meter telescope in Florida that this little camera shows great potential. The problem is we know that it's not enough here to do anything groundbreaking. We're at the moment where we're going to be able to now show the funding agencies that there is potential in this camera and beg them for more money perhaps to, to buy the next generation of this camera, perhaps to put it at Kitt Peak National Observatory, or perhaps to combine it with other methods that are going to allow us to reduce the glare of that bright star and allow us to finally image that exo-Earth. Thank you for your attention.